Welcome to uh, another episode of the one-on-one -on -one conversation on the Vast Sports Media with the national female athlete of Antigua and Barbuda, a very proud name. And in fact, it is our first female guest on our media platform. And so, you know, this is really for us indeed an honor. And it is a young, lovely young lady. Her name is Priscilla Frederick Loomis. And we'll be talking to Abe. A phenomenal athlete who has made a huge contribution not only to track and field in the OECS and Tegan Barbuda and the wider part of the Caribbean, but has also made a name for herself on the world stage. Welcome to the episode of you know this important feature here, one-on-one -on, -one on our Vasco's media platform. It's indeed a pleasure of speaking to you. How are you doing? Thank you so, so much. That was a wonderful intro. I gotta have you follow me around from now on. You can just introduce me whenever I go to track meets and stuff. <laughs> ah, that, that, for me, that would be a real honor. You, you know, I'm talking to the queen, talking to the queen of Antigua and Barbuda. So, you know, I've got to make sure that I represent and hey, have a good fun. Well, let's talk yeah. a little bit about Priscilla. Priscilla, the student before you got to athletics, starting from primary school, then to high school. Let's talk about that era. That's what I want to know about you. So as a kid, I was, always like an entertainer. I was really lively. I loved to dance. I loved being outspoken. I had a very unique personality. And my mom always encouraged it. She loved it. Um, we didn't really have like cable and all that kind of stuff. We didn't have like the luxurious lifestyle. It was just my mom and my sister and I, and we were like, you know, girl power, girl movement. And my mom gave us everything that she possibly could. She worked three jobs to put, make sure that my, my sister and I went to a Catholic school. And growing up, it, it, now that I look back at it, it wasn't that bad. You know, like these things that people look at, they're like, oh, well, you didn't have a pool and you didn't have a house. And, you know, you moved from apartment to apartment. Um, but it was just, it was great because I was able to have this connection with my mother and my sister. And so it made me very strong because I saw what my mother went through. Um, and that just made me very much more independent because I knew that I wanted to make sure that I always was this symbol of positivity um, and gratitude, humbleness, um, but also a power to be reckoned with and that nobody was going to um, you know, make me feel less of a woman or less of a person. Uh, because of where I was in life. And so growing up, um, I had, you know, normal childhood friends. Um, I would go to like summer camp and all that kinds of stuff. I wasn't, my sister was a straight A student. I was the athletic one. So my mom had, you know, a great time trying to balance that out. Um, and then once I got into high school, that's when track really took over my life. And I had to balance between track and then my love of the arts. And so, I mean, growing up, it was, it was great. I mean, our vacations were to the park because my mom would take off work and we would go to the park with my sister. So growing up, I loved it. It made me very humble, um, very grateful for everything that she sacrificed for me. Um, but now moving forward in my life, I realize that I want to pay her back for everything. So I want to make sure that um, I give her everything that she wasn't able to give me. I want to salute mom because she has really prepared you in a very big way for life. And she's yeah. kept you grounded. And so, as you said, when you share your life stories now on the Fast Sports Media platform here, yeah, folks can really understand that, hey, you had to have good parentage at an early age, and you stayed grounded, and you've made it so far. When you look back, the transformation from school to college, how was that journey? Um, it was a lot for me. My former, uh, my former coach, I was working with since I was about 13, when I first entered high school, and he was very, very tough on me. And... I didn't understand it in the beginning. And he, you know, it's always that lesson of like, I'm harder on you because I see more potential in you. And so, you know, being a single mom, my mom, she had a little bit of like a nice side where she would be like, oh, it's just my daughter, you know, it's okay. Whereas my coach would be like, no, it ain't happening. 
you know, we need to nip this in the butt. And so for me, I learned these really tough lessons from him at a very early age. And once I got to my senior year, that's when track really clicked. I realized that I had to go to college and I realized that I didn't want to be in debt. And so I went to my guidance counselor and I said, what do I need to do to get to college for some kind of scholarship? Because my, I know my mom can't afford to send me to school and I don't want to come out of college with a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. I don't want that. And that my guidance counselor at the time told me that I wasn't good enough. And so that's really when that was like the first time that somebody had actually said to my face, like, you're not good enough and you won't make it. And for me, it was kind of just like, you're making me the underdog. You're counting me out. And that's the first wrong thing you should like you could ever do. And that's when I guess this personality started to form. It was just, I'm going to prove you wrong. I don't care what you think. I'm going to prove you wrong. And what your opinion of me is none of my business. And so from that moment on, it was sprint track. And I, I went out and did, I did my thing. I broke the county record. And then I came on to be the best, you know, high jumper in the state of New Jersey. Went on to nationals. Um, it was just my mom, my high school coach, and I went to nationals, got fourth place, and it was the first time that anybody had even known who I was in track. It was because somebody counted me out, and I wanted to prove them wrong. So moving on to college, I knew that it was going to be between, I wanted to stay in New York City. I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to be a struggling actress become Beyonce, you know, do the whole stage thing. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted it all. And my coach said to me, look, you need to focus on track because, you know, St. John's University is offering you a full ride. I said, fine, I'll go to track practice, but I need to make sure that I'm skinny enough to model. I need to look good for print media and I need to have time for auditions. Like I don't have time for track. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. He was just like, you have got, you've got the ice cream with the cherry on top. He's like, you, you are going to jump over this fiberglass bar. You were going to shut up and you're going to show up to practice. All of this other nonsense goes out the window until it's done. He's like, this is a debt that you owe this school. And I said, okay, that was it. I was like, all right, I guess so. So moving on to college, I was just focused. I said, I'm in New York City. I'm going to make a name for myself and I'm going to be the best athlete on this team. And that's all I worked towards. I went to school, uh, my classes, and at first I was majoring in, you know, education. And then I realized that if I still wanted to be in that, you know, entertainment business, I could switch my major. And so that's what I did. I focused in television and film. And I, I mean, I, I kicked butt. I really did. Um, my freshman year, I went to nationals and I went every single time after that. I was focused. I was dedicated. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons. The transition was really difficult. I wanted to transfer. Uh, there was a lot of things happening. It's, it's a big jump. But for me, um, I, I handled it pretty well. I realized that I can't, I can't complain about certain situations. I have to grow up. I have to be as great as I think I can be. And so no matter what, I mean, we were a basketball school, but I will say for that time being, people knew who I was because I was making big strides for track and field because people always count out track and field. Um, and for me, I was just like, no, you're going to put some respect on the track and field name. And so the transition was difficult, but it taught me a lot. And I'm very grateful for it. I had a great experience in college. Um, and I finished it out with uh, competing at the 2012 Olympic trials. So it was, it was a lot, but I thrive under pressure. And I loved that journey. I loved experiencing it. And I loved not knowing what was going to happen, but I knew that I was going to come out better in the end. Tell me the coach's name, because I want that when he's looking at this interview, he can know that. Um, at least that, Priscilla did call his name. Yes, no, uh, we, we used to work together. He was my coach from the time I was 13 till about the time that I was 29. 
just right after the, the, the Olympics. Um, his name is Mike Pascuzo, and he is a really big coach in New Jersey, in South Jersey. He's, he's, he's the only coach in South Jersey. And so he coaches at a high school, and everybody goes to him from, like, Virginia and New York like everywhere they all go to him and he was my coach for a long long time and taught me a lot of lessons that were brutal and I would cry about and I was like yes so <laughs> but all in all I mean I learned really great lessons and I I, I definitely got tough uh, thicker skin because of him well that's that's the role of a coach so a coach becomes um your teacher your mom your daddy um, he's the one that you spend most time with. Um, he's the one who sees the talent that you don't see. So, you know, mm -hmm. he, he kind of stamped you out earlier like and told you, listen, this is hard work. So you can't be worried about all the, the, the glimpses and fans and bells and glamour that you wanted to go. Um, but he has to prepare. He has a job. And so yeah. he, knew, he knew the talent that he saw in you. So kudos. Kudos to Coach Mike. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there were many a times that I counted myself out and... Uh, he was just like, this is just part of the journey. You're not going to win every single meet. You just got to get better uh, the next time around. And so I'm very, very grateful for him and um, what he has taught me. Absolutely. 2012 Olympic trials. How was mm -hmm. that experience? And that experience then transformed you to be able to say, listen, I'm going to represent Antigua and Barbuda. So talk me through that transition period. Absolutely. Um, so... I qualified for the U.S. Olympic trials the last day it was possible. And so I didn't think, I was probably two centimeters away, and I think it was 185. And it was like this little rinky-dink meet. And again, most of the time, people would be like, oh, that's such like a small meet. I'm not going to do it. Forget it. Like, I'm done. But I traveled, you know, the hour and a half to this track meet. It was at like a little high school, but they had the official um, officials actually. And so I said, you know, and he said, my coach was like, look, you got to go. You got to give it one more, like one more try. And I moved the bar from, you know, 183 to 185, cleared it. And I was like, I'm going to the Olympic trials. Um, and I was just so excited, but I was like, I'm going against like USA warriors, like these girls are not in college. They've some, some of them have been to the Olympics before they jump 10 to 15, you know, centimeters higher than I do. But I was never nervous. I was just more excited. I was like, wow, I'm going to the trials, which means that I actually have an opportunity to go to the Olympics. I have worked so hard. I can definitely do this and I just need to show out. And that was, again, another pivotal moment where I was like, I need to show my personality. I need to just be me. This is my stage. This is it. This is, I asked God for a stage on Broadway. He gave it to me in a different way. And so I went out. I think I was, I'm pretty sure I was seated dead last, like 24 out of 24. Um, and I was one of the youngest. And I went out and I made finals. I don't even understand how I made finals, but I did. I don't remember being like super nervous or jittery. I was just like, just jump over the bar, get your booty up and jump over the bar. That's it. This is all you got to do. And I was tied for first going into finals and everything made sense. And I still have that, that picture of my name with like Shantae Lowe, which was, I think it was Shantae Howard back then. And like these great US high jumpers. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, this is it. Like, this is awesome. So I did my makeup and I always used to jump with jewelry, which my coach used to get so mad at. And so I just had a great time. I really did. I danced and I did the whole thing and I placed seventh. And to come out, like when people had been introduced to me, I was seated 24. To come out seventh, I was just like, this is a blessing. And I love this. And at the end, I went, there's like a, uh, like a carnival in the back where Nike sets up their tent and you get enough yogurts and all these kinds of sponsors and stuff. And this little girl came up to me and she said, can I have your autograph? And I was like, Oh, sweetie, I didn't win. I was like, I'm not going to the Olympics. She was like, Oh no, I know. She was like, I love you entertain me. I loved your hair. I loved your dancing. I just love you. 
And I literally was just like, okay, I get it. This is where I'm meant to be. And if, if I can't get to Broadway, I definitely can set the stage here. And I signed autographs. I took pictures. It was just a great, great moment. Um, and it was at that, when I got home, I was talking to my mom and I was just like, this is amazing. This has absolutely changed my life, but I want more. Like, I know I can do this. I know I can make the Olympics. And my college coach was the one that was just like, you know, you have dual citizenship. And I was like, well, what's that mean? And again, this is like, for me, it was so, I thought to be a pro, you had to, I don't even know what the process was, but I was like, I know I could never be a pro. And so when he talked about dual citizenship, he talked me through it. And I said, that's what I want to do. And my mom was like, well, why don't you represent Dominican Republic? I said, no offense, mom. Um, you're my mother. I love you. Um, my, the, the side of the family that I talked to most was from the Dominican Republic. I said, I don't know anything about my other side of me, of my father's side. I don't know. And I'm West Indian and I have no connection to that side of me. And I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to represent Antigua and Barbuda because it's something that I want to get to know. I want to represent a smaller island that a lot of people don't know. And I want to put respect on their name. And so for it was such a culture shock for me, but it was something that I needed to do because a lot of people have asked me like, oh, is it Antigua and Barbados? I was like, no no, you're wrong. I was like, they're two different countries. And so people like get taken back by it. And so it was one of those things where I was like, I, when people have these questions, I can actually answer them and tell them like, you guys should go visit the island. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And I know that there haven't been um, many female field eventers for Antigua and Barbuda. So to do that and to represent them in such a positive way um, and to represent so well for the field adventures has absolutely been amazing. And so I don't regret it at all. I absolutely love representing Antigua. It has given me such pride and joy um, because I love being from, you know, the Caribbean and I love Antigua and I wish I could get back more and I was supposed to, but then COVID hit. So um, it's been an amazing, incredible journey. And I'm so, so blessed and humbled that I can have the approval of the people and that they accept me. Um, it took a little while, but they accept me. And I think they're just understanding that I just want to bring respect and love to the island. Priscilla, I want to salute you because that was a very touching moment there to be able to make that decision at an early age to represent Antigua and Barbuda. And although I can't speak for everybody in Antigua and Barbuda, at least I can speak for the OECS perspective of which Antigua and Barbuda is part of. And when you follow the sporting history of Antigua and Barbuda, who was producer of national hero, Sir Viv Richards, that mm -hmm. had to be taken into consideration that as a female, you put your hand up and said, hey, I am going to represent Antigua and Barbuda. And I salute you on this day, along with the National Olympic Committee of Antigua and Barbuda for their huge contribution. And I really feel very honored that you are our first guest on the Vast Sports Media platform, first female guests. So you, you see all the firsts that are happening here. I think it has been really remarkable. And you touched me there. Um, I really say that you really touched me in that little piece, just talking about it. And it will be one of my highlights um, promotion that I will use um, going forward. <laughs> I turning do, point, I really, turning point amazing. 2014. Huh? Turning point 2014. Now yes. you, you, you went through all that processes now because you know had your coach you know, and everybody now telling you that this is what they, so you move out to the dual citizenship stage, um, land the landmark you now to get yourself now ready now to go to the Olympics and then you're turning poor. So everything is just happening in a bubble and happening fast. And no one got, like, there's no, there's no handbook. So there's no way, like, it's like, oh, this is what you do. And then you followed by this and then followed by this. And again, like I said, it was a culture shock. So every, for me, I'm like, I have to be on time. I have to do this. I have every, like, everything has a step. But for this, it's kind of just like, here, figure it out. And so 
I was trying to figure it out and do it at the best way. And it was, I think in the beginning, it was difficult because one, I was born and raised in the U.S. And so now I'm trying to understand Antigua, um, their culture, um, the way of the land, the athletes, uh, these people who have paved the way for me and for other athletes. And so I remember meeting like CJ Green and Daniel Bailey, um, Tahir, uh, and uh, Hungry. And I'm, so I'm meeting all of these guys. And then there's uh, Samantha uh, Roberts, I think Samantha Roberts, Samantha Edwards, Samantha Edwards. And she was already with Antigua and already training for the, for the Olympics. And so I met her at Virginia and she was the one that helped me, you know, get introduced. And so it was that portion of just trying to understand my, my teammates um, and kind of get accustomed to what life is like in Antigua. Cause the first time I went there was for nationals. And so I, at the same time, I'm trying to find an agent. I'm trying to see if I need to train with a group, a professional group. Um, I was formerly engaged at the time um, and I was living away from home. It was just so much happening. And then they were like, okay, we're taking you to Commonwealth Games. And I was like, what? I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> I'm so new. <laughs> so it was just, I am glad I was younger and I made some mistakes along the way. And I fell and I stumbled, but all in all, um, everything turned out right. And for me, I was very, very gracious to myself. And one of the people that helped me throughout this journey was um, Janelle Shepard from um, St. Lucia. And we became friends and she was just like, I was devastated because I didn't do well at the Commonwealth Games. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is what I do. And I didn't do well. And she was just like, it's okay. It's just jitters. It's your first time being overseas. It's your first time competing. She was like, be nice to yourself. And I was like, okay, like maybe it's not just me. I'm okay. <laughs> and at that moment, I was like, never again will I go to another meet <laughs> and not come correct. Like it's not happening. And so that whole 2014 season, I was just getting adjusted to everything. I had my first agent um, towards the end of the season. I was traveling to like Mexico and um, all these places. And I was just like, oh my God, this is so crazy. Like, this is awesome. I love it. I just need to get accustomed to traveling, competing and doing this. And so 2014 was a, was a learning, learning year. Cause then I came correct that next summer. I was ready to go next summer. So, and from that moment on, I realized, I was like, this is, I love doing this. I love, I really did love rep representing Antigua. I loved wearing the flag and I loved, um, you know, getting to wear that uniform. And we had some bumps along the way because I'm a very outspoken female. And so I don't think they were used to that. And so I, took them by surprise. So they had to get adjusted to me as well. So, but I think now we've, we've, we've come to a relationship and I think we are moving in a positive direction and CJ and I, um, and even Jody from tennis, we've come together and, you know, we just want to leave a really great legacy behind. And so 2014 was the start of it, but it, it definitely has opened my eyes again, humbled me and, just made me a better athlete. And I think it's an experience that not a lot of athletes get. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for when I hit rock bottom and when I fall because it's making me a better athlete, a better female and a better human. And that's what 2014 really, really taught me. No, you are an Olympian. Yay! <laughs> Tell me about that journey. Oh, Being yeah. told that you're going to the Olympics to represent in Tegan Barbuda. Yes. Oh my goodness. It was, uh, I fell to my knees. I cried. It was everything that I went through. Um, I've always been the underdog. I've never had anything handed to me. I've had to work extremely hard for every little thing that I've gotten and I've received. And that moment when they say, you know, we've selected you, it, it 
rocked me to my core. It was everything. It really did. I dropped to my knees. I prayed and I'm crying and I thanked God. And, you know, my mom came and she was just like, what happened? She's thinking like something happened. Like I'm having like a cardiac arrest. Um, and so she cried and she was very excited. And then I put out the announcement and the amount of support and love from everyone was really, really breathtaking. And so um, I knew that I was going up against, again, like these big dogs and I had pulled my hamstring a few months prior. And so to be able to compete again and to overcome the injury, I just wanted to go out and again, just represent. Um, I knew that Antigua is a smaller country. I, I knew all of that and I knew the weight on my shoulders, but I thrive on pressure. And I knew that I wanted to represent all, its, all of Antigua's people in like the most impressive and glorious ways. And so it started during the opening ceremony with my purple hair. And I think that shocked everyone. I think that was a really big, like, oh my gosh, her hair is really lilac purple. And so I wanted to make sure that I, you know, I made a name for myself. And my mom asked that I do something that she could tell me apart from everybody else. And she got it. So I, uh, I, I made a name for myself. And I think I represented Antigua in just a really, really positive way, just because waving that flag in the opening ceremony made it all worth it. And I, and I do it for the people and it has nothing to do with me. It's always about the, you know, the island and, you know, that's what's been most important to me. And so when I put it on my shoulders like that, it was just humbling. I was grateful. Um, and there was some turmoil, um, inside the village and, um, you know, with the, you know, na National Olympic Committee and um, I shouldn't say turmoil. It was just, I guess, miscommunication and certain things. But um, and then a couple of our athletes got hurt. So it was more of just like, just stay focused, just stay focused on what you came here to do. And in that moment, um, for my first competition, I was yeah, I was nervous. I was excited, but I was very nervous. My coach wasn't there. My family wasn't there. Um, and so it was just me figuring it out and making a way. Um, and I, you know, I jumped better than I had all season. It wasn't my PR, but it was, you know, it was good. It was decent. And I think I, I think I did a good job. I really can't be too hard on myself. Um, and so looking forward to the next Olympics, I definitely have bigger expectations and I'm working just about 15% harder than I ever, ever have in my entire life. So I'm at 115% right now. I'm training every day. I'm with a new coach. It's been going really great. Um, and so honestly, I have to take myself back to 2012 Olympic trials and just say, Anything can happen. Anything is possible. And even though I look different, I'm a little heavier, I'm a little shorter, it doesn't mean that those labels can count me out of an Olympic medal. And so I want to make sure that I make finals and I want to make sure that I'm in medal contention. I want to make sure that Antigua's flag flies higher than it ever has at the Olympics. And that is my goal. It's always been my goal. What are you right now in the world? I believe I am 32. Yes, from last season, because nothing counts from uh, from indoor, like from indoor on, like from that March, nothing has counted. So from the last time I checked, I believe I'm like 32. And for me, I'm like, eh, that's, as much as people go off numbers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I get it. The stats are, you know, they are what they are. And my PR is nowhere near what, you know, other people's PRs are, but the last Olympics, um, you know, a 37 year old woman won at, you know, a height that most people clear in practice, but people just, it comes down to the day. And I know 
that at the Pan American Games of 2015, everybody counted me out. And so I know that I can prove people wrong. And I know that I, what I'm doing in this time to make it work and to make it happen. And so it, all, it only takes one jump. And I'm not going to allow other people's negativity or them doubting me to put that on myself. I'll never count myself out. And 32 today, my first meet, I could qualify for the Olympics and I could be top 10. So it just takes one jump. And that's what I'm working towards, that one jump. And 32 can easily become 10. 10 can easily become three. Three could easily become one. What's your PR and can you jump higher than your PR as we speak right here on Vasquez Media? My PR right now is six, three and a quarter. So it's 191. So one meter 91. And it's interesting because I've cleared higher at practice. I've cleared six, four at practice. And when I look at other jumps where I was at the meet and I see the bar, and I count myself out in that moment because I'm like, oh, it's so, so high. <laughs> and I look at the actual jump and my coach shows me that I have like this much room. <laughs> and then I bail on myself. Like I'll knock it down with my hand. <laughs> I remember my coach was like, I'm going to kill you. He's like, why do you do this? And I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. And so that was, I mean, track and field is 75% mental. I'm completely an agreement with that statement because it's really what's in between your ears. It's really what's your, what your mental is. And so that's what I've been working on during this quarantine because I'm like, I don't ever want to go to a meet and allow the bar's height to dictate how I'm going to jump. I should be able to jump anything that I want to. So my goal is to jump just about 195, 196. I know people are like, oh, what about two meters and all that kind of stuff. I, I know how strong I am and I know uh, my body type. And so I would, I would be very, very blessed to retire and be able to jump 195, 196. I could be like, my booty got over it. I'm, I'm blessed. Thank you, Jesus. That'll right. make me happy. And I know for a fact that when it comes down to the day at the Olympics, that could medal absolutely because 197 won the olympics in in 2016. when okay. people were just two meters all the time <laughs> yep you're on the right track and god is going to take care of you so i know that for sure now outside of athletics um you're involved in a lot of other movements so let's first start with the blog page and i also want you to comment a little bit on the shirt that you have on because you know i got caught with that sign and it says yeah. gratitude is so Let's, let's flick it up there so that they can see that gratitude is so gangster. Break it down. <laughs> that, that's an interesting piece there. Very, very interesting. I am a firm believer in, you know, positive mentality and, you know, people, when people see me, I want them to see happiness, love, positivity, encouragement, all that. And so this company, Spiritual Gangster, um, makes these shirts and they're all about everyone being free and being alive. And so they make this shirt. And so I love it. And so I wear my spiritual gangster. Um, they have another one that says kindness is gangster. So I think it's just a positive uh, movement and I absolutely love it. And so you'll see me all the time wearing these shirts. And so I absolutely love it. Spiritual Gangster, go check it out. It's it's a great company. They don't sponsor me, but I will. I definitely um, support them and their movement, um, and I think it's really positive what they're doing. Um, so there, there's a couple things that I'm working on. Um, I am a hustler, so I don't make millions of dollars. I'm not signed. I don't have a sneaker deal, so I'm grinding and making my way and making it possible. Um, and so I think it's. It, that's why it's so important for me to promote positivity and, you know, encouragement and love and a passion because I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, you're a professional athlete. You make so much money, you get checks. 
It's not like that. Um, and so, but that's something that I, I can't complain about it. I'm not going to allow it to um, make me this negative, bitter person. I'm just going to work harder. And so I currently own my own cleaning and organization business. And so that's growing and expanding. And that I, I love to clean. I have OCD. And so I turned that into a business. And so I'm going to be hiring employees and doing the whole thing and creating that. I've had that business for four years. Um, and so then I'm starting my own foundation called the Priscilla Frederick Foundation. And it is going to um, be a scholarship for um, kids in eighth grade who want to go to a Catholic high school um, and their parents are, aren't able to afford it 100%. So that's what I want to do. And the stipulations are they have to do a sport, they have to keep a 3.2 GPA, and they must be involved in some kind of extracurricular activity that's not in sports. So whether it be the arts, whether it be computer programming, whether it be playing an instrument. Um, so it allows them, it kind of keeps them on their toes to make sure like, you know, if I, if I want to stay in this school and I want to get this good education, I have to keep the, like this, this resume in a sense. And I think it'll push them to just be better. And, you know, than they, I guess they think that they are. And it'll push them to do great things. And that's what I want. I think it's really important to support kids at that age. And so my mom was a single parent. She had, you know, random people help her along the way. And so I want to make sure that I give back and I do that. So that's my one foundation. Um, and so I'm with the business and with that. I am also adding my website and my, you know, my, my YouTube series and um, it's called to speak my truth. And I've absolutely loved doing it. I started it during quarantine. Um, if you couldn't tell, I definitely can talk and that's what I want to do in life. I want to have my own talk show and I want to have like a late night talk show. And it's been always been a dream of mine. I have about 10 different dreams that I want to acquire. And I just decided to start the one during quarantine. And so to speak my truth is where I interview different celebrities, different athletes, um, people from all walks of life who are, um, whose journeys are just very different, but they all have the same passion for success. And they define success in their own ways. So I've, you know, I've interviewed Natasha Hastings and I've interviewed Jimmy Allen, who was an American country singer and um, he's black. And so that was, and I don't think a lot of people even think that there are black country singers. So it was something like that I really wanted to get into. And I just reached out to people and it was really, really great. I had a really great response. Um, I had about 50 episodes. And so then I took a little break. And so, yeah. <laughs> So I have, um, I have about three more coming up, um, very different stories. And uh, the one is actually these two girls that I did go to school with at St. John's who are suing the Trump administration um, for a protest that they had in D.C. And so it's just I want to hear people's stories. I want to hear um, where they're at in life and how they're defining success. And so I love the show. I think it's amazing. It's been great. Um, I'm going to move it to, I believe, a YouTube series. And, um, and that's about it. I've been working on my brand. And, you know, my publicist has been doing a great job with trying to get me partnerships and just putting my name out there and just promoting that positivity and the genuineness. I, you know, you see all these people on YouTube and on Instagram, and it's like, they're trying to be so perfect and I'm just trying to be me. I'm not trying to be anything that I'm not. I show you exactly who I am. Um, I'm goofy, I'm dorky and I love it. And so I think just showing the journey that I've been through is going to show a lot of, you know, the next generation of athletes, especially for Antigua, that you can make it happen. You just got to work hard and that. And I know a lot of people say that, but I'm a product of that. You know, nobody, nobody believed that I was going to the Olympics. Nobody believed that I was going to, you know, do the things that I've done. And I just love proving people wrong. And so it's been a fun journey. And my next, hopefully my next venture, when the Antigua and Barbuda track is done, CJ and I will host a camp um, 
back in Antigua and just get to meet the kids, talk to them, um, figure out what their goals are. And hopefully we can set up like something in place where it's a system of, okay, you do track. All right, fine. If you want to go to university for track and field, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, have these lists of coaches names. We'll have, these are the times that they're looking for. You know, these are the workouts that you should be doing. Um, if you need any kind of like um, positive, like a sports psychologist, here are some that you can reach out to. Just things to get them along that way so that they don't feel so like it's so unattainable and that the people that did it were the people who actually are from your country and not some random people they, they don't know. And so that is a, that's something that we will be working on. We were supposed to work on it and then this all happened. So um, I'm very excited about that because CJ is super open to it. So is Jody, um, the swimmer from Antigua. So we're working together to, to give back and that's what's most important. So those are all the things that I'm working on. <laughs> I got you, man. You're a professional athlete. Have you ever faced racism in sports and how you feel about that? Oh, it's a tough topic. It really is because I think you, as an African-American woman, you always will, no matter where you are. In sport, in life, you always get it. And as a female, you're always, just as a black female, you're always looked at as aggressive or overpowering or intimidating. And so that's the first thing you get up with. And then you try and, in a sense, like please people. Cause you're just like, I don't wanna come off as threatening or aggressive. So I'm gonna tone down who I am. And so I have gotten it in very small doses, but that's also because I am not outspoken when it comes to certain topics or certain things. And I know that we sign a contract and the last thing I wanna do is make Antigua and Barbuda a talking point in a negative way. And so when we sign these contracts, we say, you know, you're gonna follow the rules, you're gonna post good content, you're gonna do good things. And so, for me, I feel like I'm such a goody two shoes that I'm just trying to follow the rules. Um, but when it comes to, I've experienced sexism. That's the biggest thing that I've experienced. Um, and I've experienced, you know, body shaming um, and things along that line. But when it comes to um, like a certain racist, like racist point, um, I've experienced it more on the outside of track and field than inside track and field. But I, I mean, again, I've only been doing it since 2014. And you know what? People might be saying things behind my back that I don't even, I don't hear. I really don't. But for the most part, I've experienced sexism more in track and field than anything else. Outside of track and field, I know you listed a whole lot of stuff. And so if, you're in, if you were in Antigua and Barbuda as we speak, What's your favorite food? Oh my goodness. So the first time I went to Antigua, uh, we were driving um, with um, Mr. Greenaway, who has, you know, recently passed. And he took me to a little, like, mind you, I'm from America, first world country, like all like bougie, bougie, bougie. So we stop at the side of the road and he's like, oh, you got to try this food. And I was just like, are you sure? Like, I don't, I don't know if this looks good. Um, so I was like, okay, let me, whatever you get, I'll get like, that's totally fine. Like I'll eat whatever you eat. And I, so then I was like, what is this? I was like, it's not that bad. He's like, I'll tell you after when, like when you're done eating, I'll like, I'll explain it all. And I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Is it fungi? Fungi? Fungi. Fungi. <laughs> And he said it afterwards, and I was like, what did I just eat? And he never, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, don't worry about it. Do you like it? And I was like, I, I actually do. And so I loved it, and that was like, that's the dish that I really, really like. So I, can't, I, I don't know how to make it. I wish I did. I wish I knew how to make it or somebody would teach me. 
So I think I'm going to have to go to New York and have somebody like teach me how to make it. I don't even know if I can sell it. I haven't even looked into it, but that's the one thing that I definitely was like, hmm. And, it, it, and for me, I didn't even know like bun and cheese was a thing. Like I love bun and cheese. Like I, again, it's so simple. And I was just like, this is amazing. I was like, no wonder like everybody loves Caribbean food. But yes, that's, I think it's Ponji is like my favorite, I think. I think it is, yeah. So you, had some, so you had some brownie bun and cheese then? Oh, so good. It was <laughs> so good. And literally, if you look at it, it's literally just bread and cheese. But I'm telling you, I was like, I'm going to get fat. I'm just going to keep eating this. I remember like the one guy there, he was just like, yeah, you can't eat too much. I was like, I was like, get a big loaf. I was like, get more cheese, like put it on. He was like, no, 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 no. God, you can't get fat. And I was like, all right, fine. So I had like, it, it was like the breakfast thing. Yeah. So, and I went to my first vet and then we got it right after we got the bun and cheese. And so I loved it. So I'm all for it. That's something I definitely want CJ to take me around to try like all the different like foods and stuff like that. And we can like document it and we can have like our own little Netflix series about the food in Antigua because I, it opened my, it's, 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 very very different than dominican food and that's why i like it. it's so different and they're both like caribbean islands but i just i love the differences i really do the seasoning is different how you guys cook things is different. like it's it's amazing so and i love food i'm a big fat fat so i definitely want to try more food <laughs> well i can tell you that once the track is completed when all of the technicians come in and complete the track and you come back to antigua and barbudo Raspos Media will make sure that they get you to the folks right. who can be able to show you all the ingredients of cooking. And there are a number of amazing cooks in Antigua and Barbuda. I show the list is lining up. So everybody who's going to be following this interview, hey, yeah. get in contact with Priscilla Frederick Loomis and share some tips with us so she can start practicing um, at home as to how to do fungi and getting herself organized. Oh my gosh. It's just so yeah. touching. And what is it? Uh, fungi is pep uh, pepper pot, right? Yes, yes. Um, yes, yeah. yes. I'm telling you, I gotta. I'm ready to. I'm ready. My kitchen is ready to go. Like I just needed a little cookbook, and you guys can taste it and let me know how I'm doing. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, Priscilla, I really want to thank you, and this is just only the first phase on our Raspos Media Platform One on One Conversation. You're the first female. Um, this will go down in history. Um, for <laughs> our organization, and I really had a real fun time. Again, congratulations to you on being named Antigua and Barbuda Sportswoman of the Year. That's a, a real big honor. It's always feels so good to be, you know, named on the international scene. So to have you on on this platform is really encouraging. And just to let all the folks know, we're looking at this special interview here is that you can follow us on Instagram, um, on SoundCloud. Um, you name it. Um, Priscilla Fedric Loomis, a name that you have to look out for once they have the 2021 Olympics. And we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, outside of that, Priscilla will be in Antigua and Barbuda and will be given back in a very big way along with CJ. She's got an entire team. And Vasco's Media wants to team up with her to make sure that we'll be able to execute that. Your final words, my dear? And trust me, as you can see, I'm sweating and still smiling. So you must know how nervous it was for me um, to be having this interview with you. Oh, thank you so, so much. I'm truly, truly humbled and blessed that you invited me today. I had a wonderful time talking. You can always call me up. We can chat anytime. Um, I really just want to tell everybody back in Antigua that I love you guys. You guys are always in my prayers and I'm hoping that I represent you guys in the best light ever. Um, I'm doing everything that I possibly can. Um, while training to make sure that, you know, I bring back a medal to you guys. And so I do this all for you. And um, I hope you guys are all staying safe. And I will see you guys very, very soon. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. And give your regards to your mom and to the rest of your family, your husband, all of your coaches who have helped you so far. And, you know, feel free. You know, we will have some double combinations from your platform with Vast Sports Media going forward. So I'm looking forward for the 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 networking and the connection to collaborate and awesome. take it to another level. Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. God bless you. You have a good day. You too.